it's a rainy Wednesday morning. I typically say Thursday, but uh, as we've been announcing, we're changing the rotation a little bit, and I'll be delivering Wednesday devotions. Uh, Wednesday is also our staff meeting day. So, and it's, I was with the men at 6.30 this morning, so Wednesdays are a busy day. But uh, for lots of reasons, this makes sense to my schedule, and Linda Mori was accommodating and allowing me to uh, make that change. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the service on Sunday. Um, what do I want to say? Gordy preached about the power and about being the light of Jesus to the world. And it was his first time from our pulpit, and uh, it was good to have him speak in that kind of way. A nice spirit of worship existed in the, in the congregation. Uh, numbers are down, of course, but uh, this Delta variant is something to be careful of. Friends, if you're vaccinated, it's not as severe, but it's still a good three or four day flu, if not more. Uh, for some people, it's been two to three weeks. But uh, for most people, uh, they're staying out of the hospital. We have had a couple in the church that have been in and out of the hospital. But uh, we have a lot to be grateful for at South Harbor Creek. No, um, uh, we just want to be careful. We uh, need to be careful. If you feel like staying home to protect others or to protect yourself, please do that. We'll try to minister as effectively as we can through the telephone, through um, through the internet, uh, through streaming, uh, through daily devotions. It's good to have you with us. Uh, we'll be beginning a new sermon series coming up this Sunday. I'm kind of excited about it. It's uh, from the first three chapters of the book of Revelations. Uh, we're not going to do the whole book of Revelations, but we'll set some groundwork that might let us do that later. Why this passage? Well, apart from the Gospels, there are more red letters in Revelations 1, 2, and 3 than there is in the, anywhere else in the New Testament. Jesus is speaking. And anytime Jesus speaks, I think we need to take note. We so often bias ourselves towards the Gospels. Let's see what Jesus says in a time of strife and conflict and persecution. Uh, the context uh, is, 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 is debated a little bit. It could have been written just before the Romans captured Jerusalem. So that would have been more like a Nero would have been the emperor. Most scholars, most academics, though, think that uh, the book of Revelation was written by John in the course of a vision while he was on Patmos uh, as a religious prisoner, political prisoner. He uh, receives a vision from God with the help of an angel to help translate or move him through the visions. Uh, and most people think this is around 95, maybe 90 A.D., why do I mention that? What does that mean? That means roughly 60 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. So 60 years after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the Christian church in Turkey in particular, they called it Asia Minor at the time, um, was struggling. Think about a 60-year cycle. Think about 60 years from in our case, 1960. So the time of John F. Kennedy to today would be about 60 years, and that's roughly the time frame we're talking about. A lot of things have changed. <coughs> One of the things that has changed is that Domitian is the emperor. Domitian was an evil, corrupt, and awful uh, emperor uh, in the League of Caligula, in the League of Nero. Uh, but they were also uh, promoting actively, and he believed that he was like God. So the divinity of the emperor was being imposed on all the Roman Empire. Basically, it was called emperor worship. And in that context of worshiping the emperor, uh, there were pockets of churches that just knew that wasn't true. They had experienced Jesus uh, either directly or indirectly, but they've experienced the Holy Spirit directly. And they knew that there was a truth apart from the emperor and apart from the Roman Empire. But they were discouraged. They were being persecuted. They were being forced into second-rate or third-rate jobs. So they weren't even able to have good employment. Uh, and it was beginning to catch up to them. They were getting discouraged. 
So what happened? God says his people, the church, needed a special word. They needed a revelation. They needed a, um, what do I want to say for revelation? They wanted to uncover something for the, for the church that had not been covered before. So Jesus, so God uh, gave John this vision. It makes it um, a revelation, but it basically affirms the divinity and sovereignty of God Almighty, who was, who is, and will ever forbe. A bold declaration in the face of imperial worship, emperor worship. He also is very Trinitarian. Uh, there's references in verse 3, I mean the first three verses, about the Spirit, about Jesus, and about God. The book of Revelations is also a prophecy, a, a telling of things to come, and it's also a letter. John communicated the words of these visions in the form of written word. The Bible tells us in um, verse 3 that whoever reads these words, whoever hears these words, and whoever responds to these words will be blessed. So the book of Revelations begins in chapter 1 with a blessing. You will be blessed. And I think that's one reason why I wanted to, to, to do this. In, our, in the life of our church and where we are in the church year and the calendar, I wanted you to have a blessing. We're not persecuted the way that they were in the Roman Empire, but our churches are threatened by many of the same things that threatened the church back then. So in the first three chapters, Jesus addresses a message for each of seven churches, seven different messages. And I'm going to encourage us to consider which church represents the condition of our life individually, and also which church represents and is similar to South Harbor Creek Church. Because if these words were relevant to the church of the first century, I believe they're relevant to the church today and to the church tomorrow. And we should consider which of these churches uh, we are like. Um, a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation. The number seven is used 52 times. Imagine this, seven beatitudes, seven stars, seven trumpets, seven plagues, seven churches, seven seals, seven thunders, seven books, seven spirits, seven horns, seven signs, seven hills, lampstands, eyes, crowns, and kings. We'll lock at uh, the word seven. Some people, dispensationalists mostly, think of revelations as a, as a linear progression. Traditionally, if you look at church tradition over the past 2,000 years, that's really a view that's only existed for about the past 100 years. Amillennialist and postmillennial. I'm probably an amillennialist and I'm probably a covenant. Uh, a covenant person. And I'll explain what those mean in upcoming talks and upcoming sermons. But I believe that the, the book of Revelations is basically encouraging people, reminding them who God is. I see it as seven movements of worship, seven movements where you feel threatened and insecure. And then through the vision declaration and proclamation of Jesus. You move from being insecure and threatened to being affirmed and reminded as though you were in the throne room of heaven itself. And each of these seven movements culminate in a time of worship. I'm already talking with Linda Mori a little bit, and we're going to try to end our services, I think, with ecstatic and elevated worship as we go through these first three chapters. We also want to look at the churches of the Revelation, the church of Ephesus, hardworking and patient, but they had lost its identity. They forsake their first love. They had a divided love and it weakened it. This morning in the men's group, we talked about the screw tape letters and, and Wormwood, the, the junior devil who's trying to unseat a believer, was encouraged to just don't hit a home run. Don't, don't, don't make him turn his back on God. Just open up his heart a little bit so that there's room for something besides God in their life. 
and eventually the natural flow of things would continue to, to, to squish Jesus and expand the competing heart and interest. The church in Ephesus, which is one of the most significant and impressive churches, uh, had allowed other things besides the supremacy of God. Worship style, for example, began to be more important than the one they worshiped. Things about worship became more important than the people they were worshiping with, the care and the love of each other. And then we're going to see the church of Smyrna. It had been faithful, and through persecution and martyrdom, it's been uh, held together, but it became complacent. It became content. Sometimes I wonder if South Harbor Creek has become content. Maybe we need a project or a mountain or a challenge that would, would renew our, 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 our vigor. The church of Pergamon, it was loyal to Christ, but it began to tolerate bad teaching. We mustn't ever tolerate teaching against or contrary to the Bible. Thyatira, a good church, but they tolerated pagan practices. It's okay to come worship with us. We'll worship God, but we won't, we won't encourage you to give up things that are really tearing you down. And when it's tearing you down, it's tearing down the church. We, we, we talked this morning in men's group that uh, in Oswald Chambers, that if someone is going downhill, they're typically affecting others around them in their wake. And I've seen that. One person gets the grumbling, then two people get the grumbling, then five people get the grumbling, and it becomes contagious. So it's more than just you that's affected when you begin to turn your head from the focus, which is always Jesus, always God Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit. The church in Sardis was dead. Uh, they were actually worshiping idols. So Jesus has a word for them. The church in Philadelphia, it's strong and faithful, but it too had grown complacent. And the church in Laodicea had grown weak. Friends, we're going to have a great time as we look at chapter 1. I would encourage you before Sunday to read chapter 1. We're going to see blessings. We're going to see a proclamation. And we're going to see a vision of Jesus. And the reason that Jesus is important is unless we have the proper sense of who Jesus is and what Jesus um, thinks and says, we lose sight of our very source of power. We lose sight of Jesus and we've lost everything. So friends, I'm inviting you to join us in the next three, four, five weeks as we look at Revelations 1, 2, and 3. This Sunday, we're going to look at chapter 1, so please read it. But we're going to read about the blessings that God has promised. We're going to be looking at the proclamation of who God is. And we're going to be looking at a vision of Jesus so that we have a proper sense that we worship the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and not some emperor, not something of this world. Dear God, be with this congregation, be with this little class, be with this group of devotion oh, people. Be with our church, be with our staff. Be with those that aren't feeling well and be with those that are feeling great. If people are making hard decisions, I pray that they might have the strength to see your way through those circumstances, that you might be honored. Lord, we're all called to renew and recommit our faith and trust in you. We repent from those things that have distracted us and we recommit and renew our faith in you. Help us to be ever obedient. And all these things I pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.